Hey everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Esports Wave. I know it's around the holiday season, things have been a little hectic for a lot of people. Still wanted to get this up and out there to get you guys up to date, so thanks for swinging by and checking it out. A bunch happened over these past couple weeks, tournaments coming and going, preseason for Overwatch League, a bunch of minor tournaments and even major tournaments among all the MOBAs and everything out there. But to keep it simple and keep it quick, let's just focus on two of those stories. First up, we have the Overwatch League Path to Pro. Now, this was important for the league itself. I was actually really interested in this because looking at most sports from the outside, there always seems to be a way for someone to go from amateur to in the minor leagues to actually joining the major teams. And I didn't really feel like this exists easily in esports. You really have to get noticed by just playing the game and eventually running into the pro players at the higher ranks of the MMR, maybe get your name out there join the community a little bit, finally get to know someone on a team, play with them, have them see how you work as a character and a player. And it, that's the only way, really, at this point, to achieve anything in these games. I, didn't, I just don't know how that's achievable in the Overwatch League if it's all about keeping the teams together, training, focusing on that. I was really looking forward to finding out what their plan was to try to get new blood into the system, to get people hyped about possible rookies coming up through the ranks and finally joining the big leagues. Because Overwatch League has that problem. The bread and butter of most other leagues are, are the minor ones. The games you'll see where just teams with completely unrecognizable names, no sponsors, they'll just pony up some money and get out there and try out in some of these lower end tournaments for a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars no problem and it's a great way to experience that and see like all these new people showing up but overwatch league it's supposed to be a restricted thing it's supposed to be a very closed off community they still will allow side tournaments but it won't have as big of a backing as what the overwatch league has with blizzard and uh mlg and all that so what's been outlined looks like about two steps before achieving pro rating they have the Open League, which is sort of just make teams, uh, experience the smaller end tournaments, get a little bit of exposure that way, and as you as an individual player become better or more noticed in that arena, you'll move upwards to the next tier, which would be the Contenders League. The Contenders League is really where people are going to be looking to scout new players, new talent. Uh, it should hopefully keep that churning. What Really, I'm interested in now, though, is if you consider Overwatch, it's not like a massive team. You don't have to fill 20, 30 roles like for different parts of the game, different moments, and ha make sure you have it all as a big working organism. It's just smaller teams, a uh, couple rounds, which I'm not even too sure whether people can swap out in between rounds. I'm pretty sure they have that set up to allow, but... It also it doesn't feel like there's going to be a lot of churning, a lot of player changes until there's way more teams, which we'll have to see what the future holds for that. For now, I mean, how many people are going to be able to move through the Open League to the Contenders League, and are we going to be seeing them join the teams in a year? Less, maybe? It's going to be interesting, because what happens then? Do the people part of the team get dropped? How many people get cut? I know they have contracts, but those contracts, when do they expire? Are they only like a year? Are they two years? Will we see big churning of names within a year or two after, I guess, the seasons all pan out and we see who the winners are and who the losers are? Because that's always been a thing in esports. You always build a team for the finals. You build to try to achieve a victory in the biggest match of the year. And if that doesn't happen, the moment your teams fail on the way there comes this next step, which is just to rip it to shreds, have one person who's considered to be like the best on it, and then have try to find a group of people who work with that one guy better than anyone else to see if that'll work the next year. And that seems to be the constant going forward. This only ever stopped when Navi was in its prime during Dota 2 because that really pushed those people in the eyes of everyone else as like I guess almost marketable players they were constantly on Navi you could constantly look to them as characters to follow stats to follow on that team specifically and that really drove Navi into this place of having a great viewer base that wanted to buy their merch to wanted to follow them but then as that fell apart we've come to this place in other sports where it's 
just that perpetual changing of teams, constantly altering people leaving and coming back mid season. And it gets very confusing. It is the most confusing part for most esports fans to try to track that. They'll usually just latch on to one player and follow them. But Overwatch League is supposed to fix that. But what's the ramifications? So that's really what I want to pay attention to this year. I'm going to try to keep an eye on that because I want to see how the Open League really plays out for any kind of amateurs to get into it. The other major thing that happened actually at the beginning of two weeks ago was Capcom Cup. For those of you who don't know, Capcom put on a little tour to try to, I guess, whittle down the amount of players who would be going to the Cup. They tried to make it as inclusive as possible to new players, new names, to be able to achieve incredible things leading up to finally going to this major tournament. Of course, they brought back some of the names from the original Capcom Cup uh, the year prior. Uh, those people basically earned their seat at the table. But through the open tour, Capcom also pulled in some new names, some names that people have heard of, but only in passing through a couple minor tournaments here or there. They even brought people in from countries where the fighting game scene isn't necessarily as strong. So that was really interesting, especially since one of those people took the whole tournament. Great competition tends to have great story behind it. And you're seeing in the Capcom Cup, most of the big titans of the industry show up, Takedo, Daigo, they're there to defend their names as the best. And then to have just people show up from all over who you've maybe never heard of and to actually watch them fight on par with all these big name people was this incredible, like, I was rooting for a lot of them. I, I'm a big fan of Takedo. I love Akuma. He's like my main currently in Street Fighter V. It's a great character for me to play. It fits all my style. And I love watching Takedo play him. But when, but then when I'm watching Mena RD play leading up in the brackets, it's like, man, this is incredible. I know a lot of the pros talk about how Birdie is this terrible low-tier player, but I've always held in my own heart the idea that maybe people in the pro level consider these characters to be terrible in the meta simply because they haven't put in the time or effort to learn them and that they're so far apart from that play style that they're used to that it's going to take a person who really devotes themselves to that character to show everyone that no this guy isn't the bottom of the rung he's places well with everyone else and it was the most incredible back and forth round in the finals to watch Takedo hold victory for the first phase to knock Mena RD down, to have to then fight back through the loser bracket final round, to then fight him again and achieve victory in a very like, this is mine. This is my day. This is my win. No one's going to take this from me moment. It was, oh, it was so energy packed. I loved it. And the Capcom Cup was a massive success in of itself. I mean, a lot of us still remember when Street Fighter V came out and how just bad it was. The input lag, the problems of how the game became more about, like, you know, press buttons and hope because that's all the game will do. You, you, you're not going to have the accuracy of what you want at a certain moment is going to happen. You kind of have to just put it into the system and then... Pray to God the rock, paper, scissors pulls off and actually you win. Uh, that's, why, that's why Lupe Fiasco won in one of their little mock-up pro versus uh, big, big industry entertainment name match that they had. And Fiasco just walked away from that just absolute victor. Of course, there's always the theory that that was staged and Lupe was supposed to win it just to make everyone realize that you can fight on par with pros in the game. But there is still that element that the game wasn't fully ready and it's almost like we bought into a kickstarter like capcom put forward their kickstarter for street fighter 5 we bought in now we all had the beta at that point obvious glaring bugs and issues of balance and problems and but now where we are with the game it's where it should have been then and it's perfect for a fighting game it makes it great to watch the characters don't feel massively imbalanced like they did in Street Fighter 4. There were genuinely characters who just couldn't win against most of the other ones. And there were genuinely characters who just had massive advantages and 
frames and everything over anyone else that always seemed to be at the top of every tournament and for a specific reason they were just way easier to play with how capcom cup turned out along with everything else capcom's announced recently they're looking to come back as the company as a company that or rather that john and i are really looking forward to seeing any news from it's it feels great because it's almost nostalgic to see capcom be like hey here's some stuff we we're back now. We're back in your guys' hearts. It's truly wonderful, guys. Now, I want to keep this short because, again, holiday season is upon us. I'm going to let you guys go. Those were some of the two biggest news stories. I mean, there's were a couple bands and stuff. I've got all, all kinds of things written down for the next episode because I did want to talk a little bit about issues with Riot and stuff. But, you know, we'll leave that for them. Thanks for watching. I'm Evan with Spawn Wave Media. Until next time.